Hello everyone, welcome. We'll just give this a one or two more minutes um, to enable everyone to join us. Okay, I think we'll begin. Hello, everyone. Let me just pop this screen down. I hope you can all hear me um, and see me okay. Very warm welcome to you all. Um, good afternoon from Scotland, or indeed good morning or good evening from wherever you are in the world today. Thank you very much for joining our Strathclyde Sustainable Development and COP26 Spotlight on our Global Impact and Student Study Opportunities webinar. Um, just a reminder to everyone to let you know that this session is recorded. So um, for those of you who maybe have students or indeed friends who wanted to attend and were unable to do so, or indeed if you're just super keen and want to listen to us again, you will be able to do so. Um, as I say, we're recording this session, so we will disseminate um, and circulate to you all afterwards. Um, so yes, today we have some great speakers during our webinar, um, and I'll introduce them sh shortly. Um, we have Dr. Tracy Morse, who is our senior lecturer within our Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And Tracy is also the head of our Strathclyde Centre for Sustainable Development. We also have Dr. Scott Strachan, he's our senior teaching fellow in the Department of Electronic and Electrical Engineering. And as well as that, we have Jenny Gazard, who is our International Development Manager in the Faculty of Engineering, and myself, Melissa Cunningham. I'm the Senior Re International Recruitment Officer in the Recruitment and International Office. So before we, we kick off, before I introduce the session, just to let you know that if you do have any questions um, during the presentation, you can pop them in the, the Q&A um, function and we will answer them as we go along. Um, and we'll pop some links um, to what we're presenting about as well into the chat so that you're able to access those and have a look at our web pages um, later on. So to begin, our session will be about an hour in duration. We'll begin with an introduction on the University of Strathclyde itself. We'll then delve into our academic panel. We'll have a spotlight on education for sustainable development at Strathclyde. That will be with um, Tracy and Scott. And then you can meet our students through our student panel. After that, Jenny will introduce our Faculty of Engineering. And she will also um, give you information about the application and admissions process. And then we should hopefully have five to 10 minutes at the end um, for Q&A um, and to address the questions that you've asked in the, the Q&A or the chat function. So a little bit about the University of Strathclyde itself. We're quite an old institution. We were established over 200 years ago, back in 1796. And we were established by our founder, Professor John Anderson, as a place of useful learning. He had the desire to really create a learning environment for the good of mankind and one that specialises in practical subjects. And indeed, all of this underpins our values today and our reputation as being a socially progressive and inter leading international 
technological institution. So being a place of useful learning, we want to make sure that our, our students and our graduates have um, the tools to be successful in the working world. We're a, quite a big institution. We have over 23,000 students um, studying at bachelor's, master's and PhD research from over 100 different countries, so very diverse student population. We have won lots of awards over the past couple of years, some of which I, I will highlight. Loads of accolades, including the Times Higher Education UK University of the Year in 2019. We also won this award back in 2012. So currently we are the second, it, sorry, it was currently we're, we're the first, we're the first um, university to have won this award for a second time, which, which is pretty amazing. We've also been recognised as Scottish University of the Year in 2020, most recently um, as a, in 2022 as a top 20 university by The Guardian and Sunday Times Good University Guide. Um, and one really um, highly esteemed um, prize that we have won in 2019 and, and 2021 is the Queen's Anniversary Prize. Um, we have won this in um, two fields. The first of which in 2019 was in energy innovation and more recently in 2021 um, for advanced manufacturing. So the latter was in recognition of Strathclyde establishing not one but two innovation districts. Um, the Glasgow City Innovation District, which is Scotland's first, and the Advanced Manufacturing Innovation District. Both of these districts attract companies and organisations that are looking for a base in which to grow and in which to work with our academics and students in developing our world-class research areas. We're also really proud um, to be ranked fifth in the UK for student satisfaction according to a Times Higher Education analysis of the 2021 National Student Survey. So this is really great for us as this really showcases just the great experience that our students have studying at Strathclyde and the opportunities that our students have in terms of our teaching, research, placement opportunities um, and industry networks that they can get. So again, we are really pleased to be able to provide um, all of our students um, with all of the necessary tools um, to be successful in life. Um, and lastly, we have 24 subject areas which have been ranked in the UK top 10 across all of our four faculties. And these include subject areas in accounting and finance, forensic science, social policy, business and management, mathematics, marketing, and many, many more. So again, it really, it, it really showcases just how great it is to come and study at Strathclyde um, with these great subject areas in mind. So where are we? Well, we are located in Glasgow, which is Scotland's biggest city. Glasgow itself is only a 45 minute train or bus ride from Edinburgh, which is the capital of Scotland. And the campus itself, Strathclyde, we're a self-contained campus situated right in the heart of the city centre. It probably takes about a 10 minute walk to, to get from one end of the campus to the other. And indeed, um, Glasgow is quite a walkable city, so it's very easy to um, walk to the shopping districts, the main bus and train stations, restaurants, bars, all within a 10-15 minute walk from the campus again. We've got great easy access links to the airport. Glasgow International Airport is um, only a 20 minute bus ride from the campus. Um, and indeed, um, we're an hour flight from London. Or if you want a more scenic journey, you can take a train from Glasgow to London in only four and a half hours. So very accessible, easy to get around. Um, and Glasgow is a great destination city um, in which to visit all the other major towns and cities in and around the UK, but also a great gateway to Europe. Um, a lot of our students feedback that that's the great thing about being located in Glasgow is the fact that they can hop on um, a cheap budget air flight and uh, go to great destinations like Copenhagen or Paris or Barcelona in only one or two hours flight journey from, from Glasgow and do so on a weekend um, and visit um, all these great places as well. 
but really is a, a great location for students. In terms of things to do in Glasgow, um, as I mentioned, Glasgow is the largest city in Scotland. We have world-class shopping, we're second in um, London in terms of retail and some great nightlife as well. If you've ever had the opportunity to come to Scotland, I hope you will all attest to this. We are a friendly bunch. We love people coming from all over the world. We're always interested in where people are coming from and always willing to help those um, who are coming to Glasgow for the first time as well. And indeed, Rough Guide reader, readers um, and other organisations consistently vote Glasgow the world's friendliest city. If you like music, UNESCO um, has given us the accolade of City of Music. We have over 130 gigs and concerts per week. So regardless of what kind of music that you're interested in, there's always something for everyone. I think we're actually kicking off the our Celtic, our annual Celtic Connections Festival um, this week, um, which is really all to do with Scottish traditional music. So there are lots of different music festivals that you can attend throughout the year. Um, lots of world-renowned bands that come to, to play in Glasgow as well. Lots of different festivals during the summer. Something for everyone. And even in terms of sport, Glasgow itself has invested lots over the past couple of years into um, renovating our sports infrastructure. And because of that, we have been able to attract and indeed host major sporting events such as the Commonwealth Games back in 2014 and more recently um, the European Championships. And more recently we were host to the COP26 conference just last year which I'm sure you're all very much um, aware of um, and we'll chat a little bit about that um, further on in the session. We'll, we'll talk to you about Strathclyde's involvement in that and how our academics and also our students were involved in the conference too. We even had Barack Obama um, visit the Strathclyde campus um, during COP26 and host a round table with our students, which was amazing. So you can see here some nice photographs of the campus and um, some really um, new buildings that we have renovated, some great state of the art facilities as well. And indeed, um, we have a target, um, which we are um, pretty much reaching by 2025, of investing £1 billion into, um, into renovating um, our facilities on campus. Um, so some of these have been included in here, our Strathclyde Sports Centre, for example, that was opened a couple of years ago, and it's a £30 million state-of-the-art facility. Our Technology and Innovation Centre, which was developed um, with industry, um, for industry, and that really helps harness um, academic and industry collaboration and partnerships. And we have many research centres, organisations and departments um, within the Technology and Innovation Centre as well. And this is situated on the heart of the, in the heart of the Strathclyde campus. Our library has some newly refurbished study areas and the bottom photograph there is our learning and teaching building which was opened just last year. This is a one-stop shop for students um, whereby we have our international student support facilities there, we have um, bars and um, cafeterias, we have lots of um, study spaces and booths new classrooms as well, um, and our Strathclyde Union. So lots going on there um, and some excellent, excellent new facilities for our students to avail of. Just to show you then what Glasgow looks like really um, and how, I suppose, how eclectic um, it is um, structurally and um, architecturally as well. Uh, the top photograph, Glasgow is actually Gaelic or Deer Green Place. Um, we have over 90 parks and green spaces in and around the city which is really great so if you want to get away a little bit from the hustle and bustle of the city you want to meet up with friends have a picnic and um, just relax there are plenty of spaces in which to do so in Glasgow you can see the buildings here and um, we have lots of different museums around Glasgow as well which offer free entry um, and the I like to call a little spaceship or spacecraft, if you like, at, at the bottom there. 
That is actually our um, Hydro, which is a multi-purpose indoor events arena. Um, so lots of different sporting events um, and music concerts and gigs happen within this arena. And fun fact is that it is the second busiest arena in the world after Madison Square Garden in New York City. So that's pretty cool. You can see here the, the heart of the Strathclyde campus. And we're still really um, doing a lot of um, different types of renovation as well, even, even now. Um, so you can see lots of, we're developing this area um, in the middle, which used to be a brownfield site and um, making it a lot more greener and making sure that we have a lot more um, study spaces, picnic tables and, and places for students to hang out. Um, we also have um, on-campus housing and lots of our different facilities, buildings, classrooms, etc. You can find located here um, in the photograph. So just to very quickly introduce our faculties to you, we have four faculties at Strathclyde. We have our Faculty of Engineering, which my colleague uh, Jenny will chat to you a bit later on. We have our Strathclyde Business School, um, our Strathclyde Business School won Times Higher Education Business School of the Year back in 2016. It holds triple accreditation and it has done so since 2004. And it's the first business school in Scotland to have achieved this triple accreditation as well. So what that means is regardless of where you go in the world with your Strathclyde Business School degree, it's going to be recognised. We also have our faculties of humanities and social science and our faculty of um, science. Many courses within these faculties have placement and research centre affiliations. Um, and a lot of our subject areas are top 10 in the UK. These include um, communication and media studies, math, politics, biomedical science and social policy. The Faculty of Science is home to the UK's first Fraunhofer Centre. And the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences also offers a law and mediation clinic in which students can get involved in that too. So I'll run through our undergraduate and postgraduate opportunity, opportunities just to um, make you aware of the structure of our degree. Um, so in Scotland, if you come to study a bachelor degree, these are typically four years in, in duration. The great thing about a Scottish four-year degree programme, and certainly at Strathclyde University, if you come in onto the business school or the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, is that you can pick and choose different subjects in the first two years of study and before you decide what you want to major in um, or, or which subjects you will take to graduation. That's at the end of uh, second year, you will decide that. So there's great flexibility in the in the degree structure of, um, within those two faculties. Within science and engineering, obviously we offer lots of professional degrees within the four-year bachelor programmes and within these two faculties as well, we do offer some five-year integrated masters. So within five years, you could graduate both with a bachelor's and a master's degree. The great thing about um, in Scotland about a master's programme and indeed in the UK is that um, compared to other masters, it, for example, in the US and Europe, if you're, if you're looking around, is that our masters are one year in duration as opposed to, to two years in many other countries. Essentially, it means that you graduate quicker and it's cheaper as well as you're only paying for one year tuition fees. The structure of our masters, of our master's degrees are typically, you will study top classes for two semesters and then essentially you, you will have a couple of months um, at the end of, of the top classes whereby you will have your own independent study and, and where you undertake a dissertation or a research project. The University of Strathclyde as well is also top 20 in the UK for research intensity. So that's to do with how much of our staff is involved in research. Um, and we're also top five in the UK for research industry income. We've actually tripled our, our research income over the past 10 years, which is amazing. We have really strong industry links, um, which I've mentioned in terms of um, the placement opportunities that we can offer students in terms 
talk about innovation districts as well. And so what does that really mean for students? Well, it means that you guys are going to be taught by um, the best academics who are the most knowledgeable in their fields of study. And it means as well that you will have more opportunities as well for connecting, uh, for networking and connecting with wider industry. So loads and loads of opportunities for students. And again, that goes back to the ethos of Strathclyde being a useful place of learning, making sure that our graduates have the tools to be successful in the working world and to provide for the wider society too. So um, I'm going to introduce our speakers for our guest speaker session. This is our spotlight on education for Strathclyde develop for sustainable development at Strathclyde with Dr. Tracy Morse and Dr. Scott Strachan. And then we'll have our student panel. Um, and our students today are Maria Isabel Cabrera Castro, who is currently studying her MSc Environmental Entrepreneurship, and Quinton Stoll, who is studying her MSc in Social Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Isabel is from Mexico and Quinton is from France. Tracy and Scott, um, I'm I'll just stop my screen just now and I'll pass over to you. I think you have some slides that you want to share. Great, thanks very much, Melissa. And um, I think Scott is going to do the honours in sharing the slides. So thanks, Scott. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, and I'm, I'm really delighted to, to have been invited to come along today and talk to you all a bit about how we at Strathclyde are really kind of striving to put sustainability at the heart of everything that we do, and especially um, our student experience um, with us. So Scott, if you could change the slide for me, please. Um, I'm sure that for most of you by being here today, you're, you're already familiar with the 17 ambitious UN Sustainable Development Goals that are shown in this circle here, and they're kind of associated pillars of sustainable development. Now, these are incredibly complex and, and reflect the challenges and the different interrelationships between our environment and our society and our economy that ultimately we as a, as a global community we're trying to address. Um, and we at the Strathclyde see those pillars as really integral to the purpose of our institution. Now, as um, Melissa's already touched upon, um, looking at these kind of issues is nothing new um, to the university. We've got a strong tradition of being socially progressive and dedicated to making that long lasting societal impact. Um, and as Melissa already touched upon, our, our founder, John Anderson, back in 19, uh, 1796, sorry, um, said that we wanted to aim to be a place of useful learning. And that ambition is as true today um, as it was then, particularly around the issues of sustainability. We've got a really good track record in this area, and Melissa's given great examples of awards the university's won overall. But specifically in sustainable development, we rank 32nd in the world and first in Scotland in the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings. And those rankings measure our institutional contributions towards the UN SDGs with all the different activities that we do. Um, we've also won lots of other very sustainable development related awards. Again, as Melissa mentioned, the Queen's Anniversary Prize. Um, and that's also as a result of our work in energy and, and innovation and um, advanced manufacturing as well, which includes those collaborative Glasgow City and climate innovation districts that we're very proud of. Um, in our teaching and learning, our vertically integrated projects for sustainable development that Scott's going to tell you a little bit more about in a moment, have also won several awards, including the International Green Gown Award for Student Engagement and the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education Award for Campus Sustainability Research. So I think these kind of show that we're really driving um, sustainability into what we're doing in teaching and learning and our research and our work and operations and that we see it as incredibly important. Next slide, please, Scott. And this is all really underpinned and supported by the fact that sustainable development is central 
to the to our vision 2025 our strategic plan that as a university we're committed to at the moment and that commits us to embedding sustainability across all of our different activities so not just our teaching and learning that we're going to focus on quite a bit today but also in terms of our research and our innovation of our operations and all of our partnerships and global engagements as well and we have engagements that go on across the world in different research um, and educational engagements as well and making sure that those partnerships and engagements are equitable and ethical is incredibly important to us next slide please so how we do this in practice is by coordinating all of our activities across two university-wide teams so sustainable strathclyde who coordinate our operations and i'll talk a little bit more about that and um, once scott's given some good examples of our education for sustainable development and then our center for sustainable development which as melissa mentioned i i lead and which coordinates our sustainable development efforts across both our research and innovation our global engagements and our teaching and learning which scott is the institutional lead of as well um, key to all of our efforts is to work hand in hand with students with whatever we're doing and it's very much that we're still on a journey towards sustainability we're definitely not there yet and and student engagement is part of driving um, our improvements and innovations in terms of our teaching and learning and our research and we want to ensure whatever possible we embed that research into our teaching um, and as melissa said what we want you to leave strathclyde with are those necessary skills and competencies that we all need for the 21st century so um, on to the next slide, please, Scott. And then, so to talk a bit more about our efforts um, that embed sustainable development across our curricula um, and what you can expect if you come to study at Strathclyde, um, I'm gonna hand over to Scott Strachan, who leads, as I mentioned, leads the programme here. So over to you, Scott. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Um, so as Tracy said, everyone, uh, good to, to see you all here. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you're coming from. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to present to you on our plans and the progress that we've made around embedding education for sustainable development in curricula <clears throat> here at Strathclyde, but I'll introduce myself first. So my name is Scott Strachan. I'm a senior teaching fellow from the Department of Electronic and Electrical Engineering. I teach various modules here, um, including renewable energy technologies. Uh, I've had the privilege of leading our Gambia Solar Project since 2007, where I've worked alongside tens of our Strathclyde students uh, from my department and over the, the university uh, over the years to electrify 14 schools uh, across rural Gambia. I'm the co-director of our Vertical Integrated Projects for Sustainable Development Programme that I'll talk about shortly. And I've also been tasked, as uh, Tracy mentioned there, with leading the university's efforts to embed education for sustainable development in our curricula. But it's important to <coughs> point out that I've not always been so active in this area. In fact, uh, when I graduated in 1994, and I'll point out here just uh, in case there's any confusion, uh, the one on the right is me in 1994, not the one on the left, uh, from this department that I'm in now, uh, from this very institution, my focus uh, like many graduates, new graduates, was in getting a job. And I was looking for a job coming from AAA, Electronic and Electrical Engineering, a job in oil and gas. Uh, and I was completely oblivious to the climate crisis, as were many of my peers, and as were much of the wider general public <clears throat> at the time. Uh, and this rather provocative quote from uh, the chap on the left here, uh, the world-renowned ecologist and educationalist David Dorr, captures this widespread ignorance, I suppose, that existed at the time. Um, and, you know, and I can confess that he was talking about me then in 1994, as I graduated, I was this ecologically illiterate degree holding homo sapien that he talks about from the class of 94. Um, I was eager to succeed at that time, looking for a job in oil and gas, as I said. Um, however, at that time, uh, you know, the climate crisis had only really started to filter into the public arena and our consciousness. Um, this was the year that the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNF Triple C, as it's, as it's known, came into being. This was the year of COP1. We've just had COP26 now 
um, uh, just recently in, in Glasgow. But we fast forward 25 years or so, and a lot has changed since then, thankfully. Uh, there's much more eco-literacy among young people, much of it self-taught um, now uh, than there was back then. Uh, and I'm, I was very grateful, as I'm sure many of us were, to see the activism of young people at COP26 here in Glasgow, uh, where it was clear to everyone that but for that activism, we might not have made the progress we've made to date. Uh, and, you know, we, I think we all agree there's still a long way to go in that respect. Um, this uh, uh, Students Organising for Sustainability survey, SOS UK survey, uh, conducted across thousands of students uh, from various countries, you know, it shows the student experiences and expectations around teaching and learning for sustainability and the demands from our students. When I say our, I mean uh, higher education students um, across the world uh, to actively incorporate sustainability in education at the university. And we need to listen to those voices. And at Strathclyde, I'm delighted to say that we are doing that. But I guess what David Orr was really saying back then was that we need to change, and we need to change uh, the way that we educate our students, what we educate them about and for, because he could see then what we can all see now, um, that our graduates are entering a rapidly and vastly changing world. And so it's incumbent on us as educators to ensure we embed the processes and the practices required to better equip you uh, with the right knowledge and understanding and competencies and skills and attributes required to meet these wickedly complex and interconnected societal, environmental and economic challenges of the coming century. Uh, and that you, our students, are educated not only about sustainable development, but for sustainable development, to make the changes that are needed uh, and, and to do that urgently. Uh, and that's fundamentally what ESD, Education for Sustainable Development, is all about. And so ESD isn't something new. It's evolved through numerous Earth Summits, COPs. Over the past 25 years, we've had a decade of ESD. There have been global action plans around this. Um, and then quite recently, just in May last year, 80 government ministers uh, signed what's become known as the Berlin Declaration on education for sustainable development. And then more recently at COP26 in Glasgow, the terms of that Berlin Declaration were incorporated into a COP de declaration. And so, you know, it, I think what we can see now is that, um, you know, climate education, education for sustainable development has now been treated with the same urgency as many other climate mitigation and adaptation measures and targets. Um, and the International Energy Agency in a report last year stated that more than half of the technologies will need deployed at scale beyond 2030 to achieve net zero by 2050 haven't been developed yet. Half of the technologies we will need to achieve those 2050 targets haven't been developed yet. So if you want a sense of the urgency for embedding ESD, across all levels of education, ask yourself who you'll be looking to, to develop these technologies and their implementing policies and develop viable businesses around them uh, and design the numerous other mitigation and adaptation measures we'll need to make the changes we need to make at the scale and pace we need. Uh, well, let me tell you, it's most likely to be you. Um, so this means introducing more transformative, experiential, problem-based types of learning, action-based learning um, into our teaching that better develop these kinds of competencies that, that you can see here. Um, you know, and, and these are the kind of competencies that employers are also looking for uh, from these new kinds of graduates, graduates that can help them navigate their businesses or shape their industry uh, in a way that is not just economically sustainable and focused on that single bottom line of profit as it has been historically, but in a way that is socially and environmentally sustainable too, focusing on a more rounded triple bottom line of people, planet and profit. 
Increasingly, businesses realise that embracing sustainability in their strategy, be it through adopting circular design or reducing scope emissions, is not only good for the world and the environment and for all of us, but it's also good for business. Uh, because as nations uh, commit to NDC targets and make pledges around uh, net zero, uh, you know, as they did at COP and elsewhere, are designed to steer us towards a more of a net zero global economy, what this means for the real economy, the real economy made up of businesses, commerce and technology companies and industry and the third sector, is that they need to respond and adapt to ensure we make good on these pledges and these targets. And they need the right people with the right skills and competencies and understanding of sustainability issues to enable them to do that effectively. And they need them urgently. Uh, and it's already been mentioned that in our Vision 2025 strategic plan that we've made that commitment to embed embedding EST in our curricula and embracing the various types of approaches that we're going to need to develop these types of competencies in our students. So this means working to ensure ESD is woven into the fabric of our formal or informal uh, curriculum, uh, teaching and learning, learning policies and practices, which means making it part of the culture at Strathclyde, an expression of our values that, that Melissa uh, and Tracy have, have talked about uh, so far. And that's why we're actively working towards that at Strathclyde. Uh, very briefly, how we're doing this, we have an ESD action plan that's made up of five main action areas uh, uh, around monitoring and mapping of what we're actually doing and continu continually monitoring and mapping what we're doing so that we can map our progress uh, as we make it. Um, around awareness raising and activism, that includes our staff community and our, our, and our student community. Um, we had the 16th Global Conference of Youth recently at Strathclyde, which we hosted uh, in conjunction with Youngo, that's the official youth constituent of the UNFCCC that I mentioned previously. Uh, and we have our own uh, sustainable development at Strath annual conference, showcasing our student uh, outputs uh, that we have on an annual basis uh, also. Uh, and we're also supporting our staff to develop their skills uh, around the types of pedagogies and best practice approaches to embedding ESD in their teaching, uh, because this is a new experience uh, and adventure for all of us, staff and students alike. Um, and in addition, uh, you know, embedding ESD effectively in our teaching and learning through this whole institution approach means also ensuring that it aligns effectively with and strengthens many of our other strategic objectives through internationalization of our curriculum to developing uh, student partnerships, social impact and outreach, uh, you know, as well as obviously our strategy around all areas of sustainability. So I'd like to draw to a close uh, by showing you a couple of examples of how we're working to embed ESD here at Strathclyde, uh, just as there are a multitude of behaviours and actions and systems that can contribute to climate change it will require multiple solutions to stop it. So there is no silver bullet. It's more of a silver buckshot approach. Um, and so critical in taking appropriate climate action is taking a systems thinking approach to understanding the problem and the solution. One that involves looking at the whole picture. It's a set of interconnected things or parts forming a complex whole and understanding the complex dynamics and interdependencies uh, that exists between them and how this affects the whole system behavior. And it's the same with the sustainable development goals. So they are so inextricably linked with each other that we need to be careful that taking action to pull the lever of one in a positive direction doesn't cause a trade-off in others that can undermine or be more damaging than the positive change we're trying to affect in the first place. So this too needs a systems thinking or a multi-solving approach to ensure we avoid unintended consequences from uh, what are undoubtedly good intentions. We avoid doing the right things the wrong way, essentially. So one of our very recent successes, which I know Quentin uh, and I think maybe Maria will, will mention also, um, was the climate fresh workshops that we conducted. So we took a, 
we can be branded this as a systems thinking approach to climate education. Um, and this uh, worked with NGO Climate Fresque from France and also a think tank from MIT Sloan uh, called Climate Interactive. So this has taken the form of a workshop program intended to educate students about climate change by taking this type of systems thinking approach to understanding first the scientific problem of climate change via the Climate Fresh workshops, uh, and then looking at the system dynamics behind the suite of solutions that will be required to meet this challenge using the, the Climate Interactive workshop. So there is a slide here that it's got a small video, a short video, uh, but I think I'm going to skip over this because I think I would rather give the time to Quentin and Maria to speak of their, their um, experience of the workshop firsthand. So another very successful program at Strathclyde is our vertically integrated uh, projects for sustainable development program, which has been mentioned previously. Um, and as Tracy mentioned, we won the International Green Gown Award uh, for a large student engagement in a large institution in 2019 for that. And also the ASHE um, Campus Sustainability Research Award in 2020. Um, but our students are the best advocates for this program demonstrating their involvement in VIP has made a real difference, uh, not only to their university career, but also their skills and competencies when they then move out into that workplace. And I like the quote here from Callum, who came to the Gambia with me, and you can see us both uh, in this, this photograph here, I think. Um, you know, and he said that you know, after completing a solar PV installation in a rural school in the Gambia, that the highlight for him as an engineering student was seeing the obvious difference that electricity was going to make to that school. The whole experience had really inspired and reinforced him uh, to, to become uh, an engineer and move forward in this particular area in his career. So the VIP for Sustainable Development Program is a four credit program that engages students in research partnerships with other students from other disciplines and research staff as they tackle sustainable development goal related research problems. So I've got a short video here, a short animation that gives you a general idea of what the concept around uh, VIP is. At Strathclyde, vertically integrated projects, or VIPs as they are known, allow our students to work alongside research staff and academics on active research projects throughout their time at university. This experience allows students to develop a deeper level of subject learning, acquire academic credits and develop the wide range of competencies employers look for in our graduates. Research teams can also be multidisciplinary, involving collaborative working between students from all faculties and departments. And so a typical VIP team may involve students not only from different year groups, but significantly from different disciplines. The VIP model offers undergraduate students the opportunity to work in partnership with on real-world research projects, while also mobilising and challenging students to become active now in tackling the most pressing global challenges of our time. We have 12 VIP projects involving more than 200 students, each focusing on a primary STG. One such project is the Energy for Development VIP which focuses on SDG 7, ensuring affordable and clean energy for all. Here, engineering, business and social science students come together to design appropriate and sustainable energy solutions. Students also get the opportunity to install off-grid systems and test their solutions in remote rural communities in Africa and India, completing 12 village school installations to date. Other VIP projects have focused on health and well-being, such as our drug discovery team, where engineers, biochemists and mathematicians have worked together to develop new techniques that can be used in the discovery of new antibiotics. Our education-focused VIPs partner with local schools in low participation areas of Glasgow and rural communities in sub-Saharan Africa the VIP for Sustainable Development Programme, getting you ready for the world of work by tackling the work of the world. Join us in making a difference through useful learning. 
So I started this presentation with a rather provocative, albeit insightful quote from uh, David Orr. And I'd like to end it with this one from another renowned UK environmentalist, Sir Jonathan Porritt. He said that we, and he means universities, should be preparing students for the work of the world and not just the world of work. And in fact, ESD at Strathclyde seeks to do both by engaging you in these wicked real world challenges as an integral part of your studies, we are actively preparing you for the world of work by tackling the work of the world. So ultimately we hope that embedding ESD in our curricula in the way I've tried to outline here will ensure our graduates, which could be you, uh, will become proactive and responsible global citizens and the technologists and innovators and business leaders and policymakers uh, equipped for the challenges uh, of what remain a uniquely challenging and uncertain future, I'm sure we'd all agree. And so at that point, I'd like to hand you back to Tracy, who will just round off her presentation. Tracy. Great. Thanks very much, Scott. And um, I'm just going to touch on these really lightly so that we can hear from um, the students. Um, as much as possible. So just to highlight another couple areas in addition to the kind of educational element that Scott's just touched upon as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've got our sustainable Strathclyde team. So they not only drive our kind of campuses towards our net zero targets, but they're also engaged with the student body on, on lots of different levels as well. So they lead in our active travel support and um, they engage with the local and wider Glasgow community, which students can get engaged with as well in terms of how the campus um, and our facilities are accessible and people focused. Um, and they also ensure that our kind of research and activities are not just something that are helping us to attain the SDGs, but they're also being conducted in a way that is sustainable as well. So anything from looking at our labs in terms of consumables right through to our flights to different areas and making sure that we're minimizing travel um, and carbon, um, reducing carbon uh, consumption right to what we eat and drink and how we eat and drink it within our campus. Next slide, please, Scott. There's lots of other opportunities as well to engage with the wider student body and I'm going to let um, Isabel and, and Quinton tell you more about that. Obviously that's been incredibly challenging over the last couple of years with most of our learning being online but it's opening up again now for the moment. Um, and as I said, you'll hear more from our students, but there are specific student societies around sustainability. We have our Climate Emergency Action Group that Quinton is a member of, a very active member of. Um, and, and other areas as well. So I'm going to hand over to them now um, and, and hopefully they can tell you a little bit more about how we work hand in hand um, with our student body. And thanks, Scott, for sharing the slides. So I'm really looking forward to hearing both of your reflections because I've not heard them before. Um, and I'll get, I'm just checking that Isabel's got your camera on, great. Um, so first of all, I'd really like to, you to, to maybe tell us what you're studying, tell us a little bit about why you chose to study at Strathclyde and what drew you to the course um, and, and how that experience has been so far. Can I maybe go to you first, Quinton? Yes, so hi everybody, my name is Quinton. I did my undergrad in France where I studied business management. And I have, there are two main reasons why I chose Strathclyde. And the first reason doesn't have anything to do with Strathclyde. It's mainly about Scotland uh, because I love hiking. I wanted to go to the Highlands. So I chose Glasgow uh, for my master's degree. And then choosing Strathclyde uh, has all to do with my, the master degree I chose. So I'm doing social innovation and entrepreneurship. And uh, so social innovation is a, quite an emerging subject and there are not many universities or already have masters in this uh, area of uh, expertise. So that's why I chose Strathclyde. Thanks, Quentin. And, and we're very happy that you came to Scotland to go hiking. We have beautiful walking and hiking in the mountains and it's a very sustainable way to move around. So we're happy with that. Um, Isabel, you want to tell us a bit about yours? Yes, thank you. Hi. Everyone, I'm Isabel, and uh, I am studying environmental entrepreneurship. And um, well, for me, it was a, 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 such a surprise to to find this program. I was looking something uh, with uh, environmental studies, but as well to apply it in the business models. 
and um, well, when I when I uh, found the program, it was very excited to me because um, in general, uh, the department, this program has um, a collaboration also with the Hunter Center of Entrepreneurship. So uh, this collaboration allows us to learn and to 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 get the skills from uh, our leadership style and entrepreneurship actions. And um, one uh, uh, of, the, of the things that I also choose struck by, it was because in general, Scotland as a country is doing for the steps to become um, a net zero country. So it's something uh, that uh, we apply, uh, that we learn in classes, how to decarbonize homes, how to decarbonize uh, certain uh, products, manufacturing. So for me, um, uh, this program uh, is, is about do things in, in practice to, to, to incorporate the knowledge and our skills for useful things and, pro and, and business models as well. Great, thanks Isabel. And I think that's really nice to hear from our side as well that that what these courses are, are driving for you are actually practical skills that you feel you can go out into the world of work, as um, Scott said earlier, and apply um, in reality and, and not just necessarily a lot of theory. Um, and I think also um, from my experience of students within your course as well, I think it's quite exciting that how you get to work across the two faculties. Um, and you get that experience of both the business school and the engineering school as well and the different perspectives of expertise. I think one of the key things for me with um, sustainable development is how we are always driving this interdisciplinary approach um, to our solutions and getting different perspectives. Thank you both. Um, and, and I'm kind of conscious that you're both here for, for one year masters and you've been very unlucky um, in many respects to come during a global pandemic. You've made it to Glasgow, but things have obviously been a bit more closed um, than they maybe would have been um, if you'd come at any other time. But equally on the, on the other side of that, COP26 has been mentioned a couple of times um, today as well. And, and you had that fantastic opportunity to be in Glasgow um, when COP26 um, came to be based in the city. Um, I'd really like to hear from both of you a bit about the opportunities that you've had just to engage in the wider student body so outside of your course as well that the university has been able to offer and I'm sure that people on the call as well would be excited to hear about what you managed to get involved in around COP26 as well and um, while you were here so maybe I'll start with you this time Isabel. Um, well for me during um, COP26 I um, Although it was difficult to, to deal with uh, deadlines and all the work that we have to do with uh, our studies, I had the opportunity to attend, to attend uh, the climate, climate fresk. And um, uh, I found it uh, really useful and helpful to understand from a creative way, the scientific uh, facts about what's going on with the climate change. So it was uh, uh, four hours of workshop with, uh, with another students and, and other uh, uh, interesting people. So uh, I actually did that workshop twice because uh, I could uh, interact in many, in many ways. Like we share ideas and we actually come up with, uh, with some self-reflections about um, ourselves and how can we help to to change uh, our behaviors because everything starts with 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 us and then we can apply um i mean external factors to the world so um and well i was very involved in, in this uh, two workshops and uh, i realized that this this workshop can be applied in my home country as well so i am very interested to apply it these activities that I found during uh, the COP26 in my home country. So more people uh, can know and can understand more about uh, the, the, the climate change actions. But in general, uh, uh, we also had uh, discussions about what we, we saw in, in, 
in COP26. And, um, and well, for me, the, the, the best experience was like attending the climate fresh because it was like a great, great opportunity to, uh, to really make another action. And uh, I was very uh, happy that the, the university encouraged us to, to, great, uh, uh, to, to do a great participation in this workshop. Great, thanks, Isabel. And I think it's really valuable to us now as well, as Scott said about these climate related workshops and giving access to all of our students to them. And I think you touched upon two great things there. One, that idea of systems thinking towards looking at climate change and helping you to identify areas you can tackle, but also just getting to meet other students um, who are in different courses, different faculties, which is also incredibly um, valuable as well. Quinton, I know you have lots of things you were involved in um, over that time and, and in the university. Do you want to give us a bit of an overview? Yes. So. Um... At the start of the year, I, because I'm in a social innovation and entrepreneurship course, I knew there would be some uh, sustainable, sustainability involved in those courses. But I don't believe that's enough to fully be aware of the sustainability issues. And I think there's still things that the university can do better. That's why I joined the Climate Emergency Action Group. Um, and the idea is to work together with the university to not only uh, bring, for example, education to the students, but also by the students. So Isabel and also Scott, they talked about Climate Fresk. Uh, so I became a, a Climate Fresk facilitator, which means that I can give the workshop to others. Uh, and in this way, contributing to the education <clears throat> and not only have uh, top bottom lectures from teachers to the students. And then during COP, um when i chose scotland for my uh masters i didn't know cup was going to be in glasgow it was a, a great surprise uh but i tried to make the most of it and i uh, got the opportunity to attend koi 16 which is cup uh for uh youth uh, which was hosted at strathclyde and i got the opportunity to be uh there and to represent strathclyde during the three days of koi 16. Great, thanks. And I have to say, you know, Quinton and, and the group at the Climate Emergency Action Group very much keep us on our toes. They're always questioning what we're doing and if we're doing it the right way and how we can do things better. So um, we really, really appreciate that student voice and, and helping us always to change and that positive activism that comes from our student body as well. So conscious of time and, and apologies, we've run a little bit over, but hopefully this has been really interesting. I want to say a huge thank you to Scott and to Isabel and to Quinton for sharing their knowledge and experiences with us as well. And I'm sure they'll be able to stay on the Q&A um, if you have specific questions for them as students too. It's always good to hear from your peers and not just the academics as well. Um, so with that, I think I'll just hand back to Jennifer. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks everyone. So yeah, as we are saying, we I know we've been on the webinar for a little while, so I'm just gonna share my screen very quickly. Oh no, Marissa, this is gonna share. So I have- Sorry, Jenny. <laughs> That's quite all right. So can we just go straight to the course slide, please, Melissa? Of course. Mm -hmm. So I just want to talk a little bit. The next one, please, Melissa, if that's okay. Perfect. Um, so I just want to talk a little about some of our key courses in the area of environment, of sustainability, and of international development. So I think hopefully what's come out across kind of everything we've been talking about this afternoon is kind of the, the wide range of courses we have, how interdisciplinary they are. So um, all of these master's courses sit across all four of our faculties at the university and they also share a great deal of classes a great deal of content as so um isabel is studying on the msc in environmental entrepreneurship which is in our faculty of engineering quinton is studying msc social innovation and entrepreneurship which is in our business school but they share i think one or even more classes as part of their studies so it's a, it's a really interdisciplinary studies it's also very open and accessible as well. So lots of these courses are open to students from a wide range of backgrounds. So um, for example, sustainability and environmental studies is open to students from all backgrounds. Um, so is the um, international social welfare, for example. So um, you don't need for some of the engineering type courses, you don't need an engineering background for some of the business type courses, you don't necessarily need a business background. So they're, they're really open conversion courses. Um, there's also lots of opportunities 
opportunities for practical real world learning as well. Um, so on many of the engineering courses, so the design engineering with sustainability, for example, um, you'll do an industrial group project um, as part of that course, which um, where you work um, in a group on placement with a real company for um, for a semester solving a real problem. So we've had students on that course working with companies uh, such as Unilever, for example, working with Jaguar Land Rover. Um, uh, so on kind of on real design projects. Um, so it's a really fantastic experience. And equally, we have very similar um, industry projects with sustainable engineering courses, with the courses in our civil and environmental engineering department, and then equally in some of the courses in the business school. So for example, on MSC, social innovation and entrepreneurship, students do a four month social innovation lab, which again is a real world, real kind of, um, uh, uh, kind of real project with real impact. Um, so a, those real kind of real world learning Learning. Um, it's also a very, um, very diverse um, student and staff community at Strathclyde, as hopefully you've seen, we have students and staff from more than 100 countries from around the world. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a really kind of, it's a really fantastic experience to, to learn from each other, as well as to learn from the staff as well. And then finally, just have, I know we've had a few questions in the chat around the admissions process, around funding for courses. So very quickly, um, the um, so application takes place online. It's a really straightforward process. Um, so um, particularly for the kind of postgraduate, we have an online application for us, which you access through the, our course web pages. Uh, we just ask you to put in your personal information, your education background, upload your supporting documents, and then normally you'll hear back from our admissions teams within um, normally within five to ten working days so it's a really quick turnaround um, we also have in terms of entry requirements those do vary from course to course and country to country but generally at master's level we'll be looking for students to have the equivalent of a UK second class degree or higher uh, and in terms of English the English requirements are generally around IELTS 6.5 but we do um, uh, accept a wide range of English language tests as well and also for any students if you're living and studying in a country where English is a widely spoken language, we can quite often accept your um, your educational transcripts or perhaps some information from your employer um, in lieu of the English language test. So, um, so that is something to not all students would have to take a formal English language test like IELTS. If we can go to the next slide, please, Melissa. Um, yeah, so, and equally, we do have kind of uh, pathways into the university um, for international students. So uh, for students that maybe the qualification you can take in your country isn't suitable for entry to degree level study in the UK. We know that's the case in several countries around the world. We do have pathway programs at undergraduate and at master's level through our International Study Centre, which is based on our campus. So that allows students to enter our degrees um, um, with, a, with a much wider range of qualifications than we're able to accept for direct entry. And also in terms of English language as well, any students that, um, that, that need to improve their English prior to starting their degree, we offer up to 29 weeks full-time English preparation courses as well. So this year those courses are taking place both online and in person. So there are, if you want to come to Glasgow, three or four or, or longer months early to practice your English, get settled in, you can do that or equally we have that same training available online as well. And the next slide please Melissa. And in terms of fees and funding, again, there's quite a broad range. Um, you can see there um, in terms of tuition, um, so the, the kind of the, the lower tuition fees there around the kind of £15,000 mark would be tend to be our kind of social sciences courses, our engineering and science courses tend to be kind of in the middle of that range, and the more expensive courses are tend to be in, in the Strathclyde Business School. Uh, so we do appreciate that studying in the UK is certainly expensive compared to many countries, um, however there, there are ways that we can kind of we can support with that so one thing to bear in mind is that the cost of living in Glasgow is cheaper than lots of other cities in the UK it's about 60 percent of the cost of living in London um, so sort of within UK terms Glasgow is a very affordable place to live and equally uh, the university also offers a really wide range of scholarships as well so those are some of our engineering faculty scholarships there um, uh, so we have awards of up to um, 
up to eight thousand pounds available this year equally there are, there are similar awards available in the other faculties and also i'd encourage international students to look out for some of the um, external scholarship opportunities as well so we work with partners such as the commonwealth scholarship commission the chiefening scholarships the fulbright scholarships um, also this year the british council scholarships for women in stem so all of these bodies offer full funding for study at uk universities including strathclyde so um so yeah we would definitely i definitely encourage you to have a look at those opportunities as well and i think that's and yeah finally um so we offer a kind of full range of support services at the university uh on campus accommodate well university accommodation either on campus or very close to the university campus is guaranteed for international students in their first year of study um and then we also have a really wide range of um, kind of support as well so a couple of that i'd highlight would i definitely highlight our career service um which offers one-to-one -one support um and loads of connections and support with employers um, uh, kind of um, for students during their studies and also for five years after they graduate as well and then also our international student support team as well that can provide kind of a full range of advice as well and one thing that I think we haven't mentioned uh, that is really important for international students to consider and something that our international student support team does help students with the paperwork with is the graduate immigration route so which is obviously the kind of recently in the last two years been announced by the UK government that students um, graduating from UK universities can stay in the UK for up to two years after they graduate um, using this visa route which is um, and it's I think it's three years if they completed a PhD as well so that's a really great opportunity for international students and I think that's everything from my side so um thank you very much and so we i know we've had lots of questions on the chat and also in um in the in the q a as well so we'll try and hopefully go through a few of those just now thanks everyone thanks very much jenny a big thank you as well to tracy and scott and also isabel and quentin for your input i'm sure that you all found that really interesting i think we are slightly over time i'm very aware of of everyone's busy schedules, but I know we do have some quite good questions in the chat that I think would be relevant for all. So I think we'll take a few minutes just to address those. Um, and at the same time as well, well, I have posted in the chat, there have been some very specific questions pertaining to um, students' applications or circumstances. My email is in the chat box. So feel free to email, e email me individually and I, I can liaise with our, our faculty colleagues or our professional services team, um, depending on, on your circumstances and your specific questions. Uh, we did have a question about choosing modules or choosing classes within your masters, which I thought was really great. Um, so if I would encourage you all to have a look on the individual course web pages these are really great in terms of containing all of the information around course content. And so if you go on to the specific master's web page that you're interested in and you click on the course content tab, you will see a list of all the courses and the descriptors as well. Now, bearing in mind um, the structure of the master's degree here in the UK is one year and at Strathclyde we have two semesters of top classes, followed by um, a couple of months whereby you will do your research project or your dissertation. So when I'm talking about top classes, what that means is there's a series of compulsory classes that you will study, but also you will have um, the option to choose a few classes per semester to make up um, the, the number of credits that we would expect for a master's degree course. Um, so those options are all on the, the, the individual course web pages. You will see it broken down into compulsory classes and optional classes under the, the course content tab. So have a look at those um, and you'll be able to see what's on offer for you. Um, there was another question as well, which was really about, I think, the, the timeline for the, the application and in terms of when to expect the CAS and um, the confirmation of acceptance for studies, which you will need um, to, the, to then apply for your visa. So um, one person specifically had mentioned having received an unconditional offer. Um, 
you can make an application. So once you receive your CAS, you will receive this once you have an unconditional offer. But that is broken down into um, an un that is broken down into academic conditions, financial conditions, and then administrative conditions that all need to be ticked off before you'll get your complete unconditional. So you might have an unconditional academic offer, okay? But remember, you would have to um, you'd have to make sure that you complete your financial conditions. That's to say you either pay your deposit or you make sure that um, you send in, if you're being sponsored by a government sponsorship body, for example, you would need to send in that confirmation letter to an admissions team for us to tick off the financial conditions. And then once that happens, once we are satisfied that you've ticked off your academic and your financial conditions, our admissions team double check all of your paperwork again. That those are the administrative conditions. That's all ticked off. And once that is done, that is then the process for students to then receive their CAS. CAS is not administered. It's it's a six month time frame, so six months before the um, the beginning of your course. Um, is when students may begin to to receive their CAS. Usually, if you're if you're beginning your course in September time, CAS tends to be issued the very busy periods is during the summer time. Um, but I'm sure um, I cannot remember your name, sorry, but I'm sure whoever posed this question, uh, I'm sure you're all organised. If you have something really specific about your application, though, and your your CAS email me and we can chat to the admissions team about that that's no problem but that's just to give everyone a general time frame and also a general overview of all of the conditions that need to be accepted or ticked off before you will begin to receive your cast to then apply for your visa mm -hmm. Jenny I'm not sure I think those were the two kind of most mm -hmm. pertinent ones that I thought would be good generally to address was there anything else that i'm just having a look through the chat uh -huh. i think there were a couple of questions melissa about kind of the last dates for doing things so the last date to pay your deposit for example the last date to meet all your conditions so i think we we don't have a formal deadline uh, for those things we know that for some students that are maybe applying for loans or that have that are graduating from their courses in, in the summer they might not get their final transcript or things till till relatively late on so we don't have a formal um a formal last date so, um so we'll try to be flexible as much as possible with um kind of uh, with with individual student cases however what we would say is we'd always encourage students to try and complete everything pay their deposit as soon as they're able to do just to give yourself plenty of time to apply for your visa to find accommodation to get ready for your studies just so it's it's not a stressful process for you um, and there's lots of information on the university website that takes you through everything you need to have to apply for your visa for example so even if you don't have absolutely everything to meet all the conditions of your offer you can still be preparing some of the documents and information that you'll need for the later stages in the process so that you can get onto those kind of straight away so that's what i would say um uh, in it say a kind of in answer to those questions mm. Thanks, Jenny. A couple of questions as well in terms of scholarships and um, there was another one in terms of scholarships, though, mm -hmm. each of our in terms of tuition fees as well. So scholarships and tuition fees. We do have different scholarships that Jenny had um, had chatted about um, depending on the faculty. So I would encourage you all get in touch with us certainly and we can give you the right information for the faculty or the degree program that you're interested in but also have a look at our scholarships database you will find a whole plethora of available scholarships per faculty and also as Jenny had mentioned some external scholarships that are advertised there through through the scholarships database you will find information certainly for the faculty scholarships whether you need to submit a separate application or not, um, and also the, the deadline for scholarships. I think a few of you in the chat had been asking specifically about um, scholarship deadlines. So they, they are a bit different depending on the faculty, but certainly have a look through the scholarships database. And if you're not sure, come back to myself and Jenny and we can point you in the right direction. In terms of tuition fees, 
These again do vary, as Jenny had mentioned, um, by faculty and by degree course as well. But if you go onto the individual course webpage, there is a tab, um, I think it's tuition fees or fees, you will find the course fees there for that actual course. But again, if you're, if you're not unsure, Jenny and I can point you in the right direction. And I'm just going to type in my email address so that you all have it. Um, but feel free to get in touch. I think I think that's maybe everyone, hopefully. I don't want to take up yeah. too much of everyone's time. Um, also, actually, very quickly, I just wanted to mention, so Jenny, you were chatting about all of the support services and facilities that we have at Strathclyde. And I know that Isabel, you seem to be involved in everything, which is amazing. You you had told me you were doing some incessional English classes, which is amazing. And um, you'd also subscribed to the career service to go on yes. the workshops they were doing. Yeah, that's that's very um, helpful. We uh, well, actually, I am uh, doing some extra curricular uh, session classes to improve my my writing for for research so i find it very helpful because while i am uh, studying i also have the opportunity to incorporate these in sessional classes uh, in during the the course so i can boost my my research skills um, and also my postgraduate writing and uh, uh, the other the other fact is that also the career services is a great department because they have a lot of tools to improve our skills before an interview and also um, they have like um, they send us a, a calendar with all the activities and meetings for uh, from um, employers so yeah, I'm very happy with, with, with the department. They are very helpful for us. Excellent. And the sessional, the sessional um, classes. That's great. So okay. I am taking advantage of them. They are, they are great services for us. Yeah, and the in-sessional classes, uh, that's um, written and spoken, is it? Yeah, yes, they are, yeah, they're spoken as well. Yeah, so it's, um, we we have um, well I I, I took do two sessional courses one it's uh, in, on Monday and the other one is on Thursday so uh, with a couple of classmates we interact uh, each other by Zoom and then sharing I mean the the, the lecturers share with us uh, material important materials to um, to know more about the methodology for for our assignments and for the research. That's great. And we've got a really good question in the chat about that as well. So that's through um, our, our English language department um, and students can avail of up to four hours of free and sessional um, class instruction um, per week. So, so yes, I think, uh, Ms. Lena, thank you for that, that question there. Um, just pop the, the link in the chat. Mm. Thanks, Jenny. Great. So I think we're, we're quite over time. I'm conscious everyone has a, has a busy day to get on with. Um, but again, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to email me. My email is in the chat. Thank you very much to everyone for joining us. This session is recorded, so um, we will be circulating the recording to all registrants later on. Thank you again to Isabel and Quentin. You have been amazing in sharing your Strathclyde stories and experience. Thanks also to you, Jenny, for your overview of the Faculty of Engineering. Our academics had to pop away. I think they've got Unfortunately, they've got other meetings. meetings. Yep, yep. So thank you to, to everybody for your time and hope to see you all at Strathclyde very soon. Thanks, everyone. A very good afternoon to you all. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.